and welcome back. Say hi to John Baptiste. Hey. I like that bumper. I like that bumper we just saw. It was like Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass does Willie Nelson. I like it. That's right. That's right. Come on, on the road again. I, I can't wait to get on the road again, man. Let's get up out of here. We're on. on the road, uh, metaphorically, this Thursday. Another live show, John. Oh, yeah, we about to get it, man. Let's that's where the that's November. where the rubber hits the road. That separates on, the men from the boys and the women from the girls. Come on. And Yes. And on Showtime, we're going to be live on election night, just like four years ago. Election night 2020, democracy's last stand, building back America, great again, better 2020. That's half the show right there, just saying the title. It's going to be so well, easy, John. I think you're gonna have to fit it on the like two screens. That's a long title. How about a little, how about a little, how about a little <laughs> rubber hits the road music? Yes, indeed. John Baptiste. Thank you, John. Hello. My first guest tonight is a political analyst, author, and host of the Readout on MSNBC. Please welcome Joy Reid. Joy, thanks for being here. It's great to be here, Stephen. Hello. Now, you have done something that very few people have done. You have launched a new television show <laughs> in the middle of the pandemic. So you've yeah. had to actually have to organize it, staff it, everything remotely. Has this been a particular challenge? Well, I mean, you know what? First of all, I like being home. So luckily, I like being at home, so it's fine. Because we, we, I did go in for the opening of the show into the studio, into 30 Rock, which was weird because it was completely deserted. Yes. So we did sort of the deserted opening shoot. But other than that, I've been, yeah, we launched it in my basement, which is fine for me because afterwards, I just can go upstairs and go to bed. You and, you and Joe Biden, <laughs> both winning from the basement. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do it. <laughs> 2020, I'll see you in the basement. Now, okay, so what has been, and this is, this is a, kind of an obvious question here, but there are so many stories going on at once. What is the central story for you right now? I know we're in an election, but what is, what is yeah. the story that cannot be ignored? Well, I mean, you know, I, I I feel like for a lot of reasons, you know, Black Lives Matter has been such a huge change in the way that, Everyone, even outside of the black community, thinks about, you know, about race and about civil justice. But even as huge as that story is, and I think that is very close to being the biggest story, I think there's nothing that can overtake the pandemic. Um, this global pandemic has changed the entire world. It's changed the way you're doing your show here. We are doing this remotely. It's changed the way we work. It's changed the way we live. It has, it has changed and destabilized everything about our lives, even the way we protest. So even if you think about, you know, online related movements that then moved into the streets, they moved back online. And in a lot of ways, just being outside, just being out in public is sort of this either revolutionary act or, you know, sort of anti-government act. You know, just being outdoors has become, you know, a political act in and of itself. So I think the pandemic is the story, if not of the decade, um, at least of this year. Well, you're a political analyst. Uh how do you analyze this moment politically? How does COVID change our politics? Well, if you think about Donald Trump's reelection, he's in this sort of frantic end game. Um, people have called it end state Trumpism, where he's just going around the country, you know, sort of freaking out about masks and, you know, downing Joe Biden for listening to scientists, et cetera. But go back and rethink of a world where in January, when Donald Trump got that briefing, where he was told that COVID is airborne, that it's deadly, that's deadly stuff, as he told Bob Woodward when he called Woodward. This wasn't even like a hatchet job. Like he didn't call, you know, Woodward didn't call him, he called Woodward and said, this stuff is deadly. Think about a different world where Donald Trump had acted immediately. He has a Svengali-like hold over 60 million people. They'll do whatever he says. They'll take on whatever cause he gives them. If he had said, the only way that you're a real man is if you put on a mask. Everybody needs to put one on. Make it say MAGA. If he had handled the pandemic as if it were a war and had gone to war against the pandemic, he would now be going into re-election with high ratings on that issue, which is the issue in the world for everybody. Everybody who can't see their grandma, this is the issue. He would be going into it with an economy that wasn't a complete and utter disaster. Think about what Democrats would be having to run against if he'd been strong on that issue. It's ruined his presidency. 
presidency, it's opened up and it's opened up all of his other flaws and made them uh, even more sort of exacerbated in the public mind. It's ruined his pol his political fortunes, and it's ruined the Republican Party's political fortunes. This pandemic is also the biggest political story of the year. Okay, so I buy all of that, except that doesn't Donald Trump's success in 2016 kind of throw up in the air our ability to exactly know what the political effect of a person's behavior is? Because Biden's looking great. Things are looking, you know, not, not everything. Biden's looking great. But a lot of people who would like Joe Biden to win are feeling burned by 2016. Yeah. I don't have to tell you. Can we know what the political reality is right now given how wrong people were in 2016. So I think, you know, one of the things I always tell people, because everyone has, has PTSD from 2016. I have PTSD from 2016. But the reality is polls are only giving you a snapshot in time, and they're giving you a general sense of where things are going. Hillary Clinton actually did win by about what the national poll said she'd win by. The things that people couldn't anticipate in 2016, which was a jump ball election, a jump ball election is harder to call because you don't have the powers of incumbency leaning against it. You don't have the actual facts of a president's performance leaning against it. It's literally a jump ball. And so you say to yourself, you throw these two candidates in the air, do I want this one or do I want that one? You measure both of their flaws more or less evenly. And so it's a lot harder to call a jump ball race. This isn't a jump ball race. This is an incumbent running for reelection. He is the thing that's at issue. It's not his opponent. It's not a, a referendum on Joe Biden, it's a referendum on Trump. And on the one job that he had, the one job, keep people safe, let people see their 80-year-old grandmother, allow people to feel comfortable going to a restaurant, living their normal lives, let their kids go to school. He had one job as president, he failed. And that means that this is an election about him. And then you start to look at everything else about him. He's there now. Well, he didn't handle the economy well when it came to the pandemic. One quarter of businesses have failed. We have 25 million people who have now signed on for unemployment. Eight million people can't pay their rent. It's a disaster of 1930s proportions. He didn't do that job well. His foreign policy chops are poor. We are pitied. Like, we've been a lot of things in the world. We've been, people have been enraged at us. They were angry at us about the Iraq war. We're now a, a subject of pity all around the world. We have few friends. And the friends we've got are like Kim Jong-un and Putin. It's not, everything about him is magnified by that failure. So no, I think the data is right, but the X factor here is cheating. It's whether or not Republicans will try to steal an election that looks like it's Joe Biden's to win. And that's what people have to worry about. And that's why people need to vote, 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 make it a big margin so it's harder to cheat. And when you, may, when you mean cheat, do you mean suppress the vote or literally yeah. steal ballots, change results? So I don't think, you know, there's the old, you know, 1960, you know, people think people are going to go in and, and, you know, you have a lot of Republicans to, the, to this day don't believe John F. Kennedy won that race. I think they stuffed ballots. That's not the way the cheating normally works. There are three different ways that you can cheat and win an election. One of them is to go after the voter rolls, to basically take people who are registered to vote. You go in, you say, I'm Stephen Colbert, and they say, sorry, sir, you're not on these rolls. And you're like, but I've been voting my whole life. They're like, like sorry, vote Basically, what happened and in Georgia? Uh, in exactly. the last cycle, yeah. Exactly, and you can you can literally do that, right? There are some people who will just, you know, stealing ballots is a very small part of it. Um, the second way to do it is to just intimidate people into not voting at all, make people think it's futile, just turn them away. We now know there was an operation that was put in place by Republicans in 2016 that was designed to deter black people from voting. And they threw everything at the black community, fake information, Russia sourced falsehoods, all sorts of stuff about Hillary Clinton to make it seem like you don't want to vote for her. Just stay home. Right. So that's another way you can steal the election. The third way is the scary way, which is to say Biden wins Pennsylvania. And then the state legislature in Pennsylvania says, you know what? We don't believe Biden won Pennsylvania because there was so much absentee balloting. We have looked at this, and in our opinion as the state legislature, we're just going to set aside the election and give the electors to Trump. That's the really scary way. And so that's the third thing we have to worry about. All three of those things are now happening all at the same time with Russia help. Uh, we have to take a quick break right now, but when we come back, I will ask Joy her thoughts about what to expect in the upcoming Trump-Biden debate on Thursday. Stick around.